I went on a date with this girl back in the early 2000s. When I got to her apartment, the door was already open. She had a small dog on a leash, and it was running around the hallways. I picked up the dog, and she called out to me. Oh, you must be my date. How are you? She then asked, Can you take the dog out? It needs to go to the bathroom before we leave. I was confused but agreed, thinking this was a strange start to our date. So I took the dog downstairs, wondering what was going on. I felt like I was her dog sitter instead of her date. The dog did its business outside, and it was kind of cute. I couldn't tell what breed it was, but it looked like a tiny chihuahua. It was no more than 10 inches tall. As I carried it back upstairs, I decided to introduce myself properly. At first, the girl seemed very stressed. Her hair was messy and she was all over the place. Don't get me wrong, she was really pretty, maybe a 7 or 8 out of 10. I was young and full of energy, so I was excited about the date. She went to lock the door, but then realized she forgot something. She ran back inside to grab her phone and purse, then locked up again. As we walked to my car, she started to stress out. Right away, something felt wrong. The whole situation was off. I felt more like her therapist than her date. She kept talking about her problems and all the bad things that happened to her that day. Eventually, we got in the car. She told me she felt really stressed and didn't want to go out. She asked, Can you take me back to your place? I don't feel like going out to eat. I felt stuck and didn't want to say no and make her get out of the car. So I agreed. I took her back to my apartment. I had a roommate, but he was out, luckily. I didn't have much food at home, so all we could do was watch TV. As we drove down the streets back to my place, which was about a 20-minute drive, I kept thinking about how weird this was. When we got to my building, I parked the car and took her upstairs. I turned on the TV, and she put her things down. We sat on the couch, and she sighed, like she was letting go of all her stress. She acted more like a worried mother than someone I was on a date with. We sat there with the TV quietly on, and she started telling me about her life. She had just gone through a bad divorce. Her husband and she had a big fight, and she ended up filing for divorce. Her life was falling apart, and she was laughing about it, like it was a joke. Ten minutes passed, and I realized I didn't want her there anymore. I felt like she was using me. Then her phone rang. About fifteen minutes into our conversation, she jumped up to answer it. She looked really stressed. I couldn't tell if it was her ex-husband or someone else she didn't like, but the call gave off bad vibes. I could hear everything she was saying and even some parts of what the other person was saying. She hung up and told me that it was her landlord. She was being kicked out of her apartment and had to move to another one temporarily. She looked at me like she wanted me to say, Oh, you can stay at my place, don't worry. But I ignored those hints. It was really awkward. I realized she was trying to manipulate me to get help. This whole date felt like a setup to use me. She told me her past relationship ended badly. It seemed like she had been using the guy, who was wealthy and had a good job. I knew I had to get her out of my apartment fast. I lied and said I would help her move and send her some money. We agreed she would leave soon because my roommate was coming back in half an hour. As I guided her downstairs, I realized I had to drive her back since we never went to the restaurant. On the drive, she kept talking about needing help and money. The whole night felt awful. I was attracted to her, maybe because I was young and she was pretty, but it was clear she used her looks to manipulate people. She gave off creepy vibes. We got back to her apartment. She tried to get me to come inside, saying she needed help packing bags and boxes for her move next week. I declined, saying I had to get back because my roommate didn't have a key. I promised to stay in contact and help her later. I drove off, feeling a huge sense of relief. When I got back to my apartment, my roommate was there. I told him the whole story, and he couldn't believe what I had experienced. I felt really lucky to get out of that situation. Looking back, it's a crazy story to tell people. It was 8.30 p.m. I was sitting in a restaurant in downtown Detroit, waiting for my blind date to arrive. I was really nervous, which was strange because I was usually a confident guy, but this situation was different and made me feel unsure. 
In the past, my friends had set me up on dates, and most of them went well because we had a big group of friends and often met new people. But there were some bad dates too. Lately, some of my best friends moved to other states with their partners. We still met up sometimes, but not as much as before. I missed our weekly bar hangouts and weekend adventures, so my social life became less exciting. I decided to use Tinder again. I thought I needed to do something, so I started swiping right on a lot of girls. My communication skills were not great, but it was still fun to see who I matched with. One Thursday night, a girl named Samantha started messaging me. At least, that's what she said her name was. I learned that many people online use fake names, partly for safety and partly for fun, to be someone different from their daily lives. Over the next few days, she kept messaging me, and we had a similar sense of humor. I told her my name was Scott and that I was 26. She said she was 28, so I jokingly called her a cougar, and she found it funny. Then, on Tuesday evening, she messaged me and said she wanted to go on a date. That was forward compared to the other girls I talked to on Tinder, but I liked it, so I agreed. I asked what she had in mind. She already had a plan. Her message said she had booked a table at a restaurant in downtown Detroit for 8.30 p.m. under the name Scott. She gave me the name and address of the restaurant and told me not to be late. She ended the message with, see you there, and signed off. I sent her a couple more messages after but she never replied. When I entered the restaurant and said I had a table booked in the name of Scott, I was shown to a table at the back, which was pretty quiet. I ordered a drink and waited. It was now quarter to nine. Then I saw the waiter leading a tall, very attractive woman in my direction. Since we hadn't exchanged many photos online, it was still hard to tell if it was her. This girl was stunning, tall, and wearing a tight-fitting dress that hugged her body perfectly. She had long, wavy blonde hair, and as she got closer, I recognized her attractive face from the few blurry photos she had uploaded. I started to stand up as they got closer to the table. Then, incredibly, the waiter walked by with her following. She looked at me and smiled briefly as she walked past. I couldn't help but follow her with my eyes. She walked past and sat down at a table in the back with an overweight, bald-headed guy. What the hell was going on, I thought. Suddenly, I heard a voice from the front of my table. I turned back from looking at the girl who had just walked past. There, with another waiter, was a much older woman in her fifties with ginger hair, no makeup, and wearing what looked like work clothes and a knitted sweater. She was about five foot four and let's just say, not very attractive. She said, you must be Scott, I'm Samantha. Well, my real name is Anid, and you were right. I'm certainly a cougar tonight. Shall we order? I do hope they have lobster on the menu. All I could think in my head was, wake up, please, let this be a nightmare. I matched with this girl on Tinder. Believe it or not, I actually recognized her. I had seen her in some of my mutual friends' Instagram posts that were tagged. I wasn't sure if I went to school with her when I was younger, but I couldn't really remember. That was almost a decade ago now, so we decided to meet up. She seemed nice, sweet, and also pretty attractive. I was working really late back then and got off my shift at about 10 p.m. She was okay with it, so we decided to meet at the park and smoke a joint. While we were there, we were just chilling and chatting. We admired the lake in the park and looked at some of the ducks. It was pretty late, so there was no one else around. I can't remember what the weather was like because this was a long time ago. But what happened next is something I will never forget. We were sitting on a bench, enjoying the park around 11 p.m., smoking a joint. It started to hit me, and I was feeling good. Out of nowhere, this girl started throwing up all over the park bench. I had no idea what to do. I was super confused, so I decided to pat her on the back, just like my parents did when I was sick. It seemed to help a bit. It was kind of comforting, I guess. But as I was sitting there patting her on the back while she was vomiting, I didn't really know what to do. This was super awkward. Thankfully, after about 10 minutes of her throwing up, she eventually stopped. She told me she had been drinking all day, so she basically came on the date already drunk. This really turned me off knowing that her throwing up was her own fault and not some kind of food poisoning or sickness out of her control made me feel different about her. 
I thought the date was going well. We had been messaging for weeks before finally meeting up at this park. I felt we were clicking until she started vomiting and explained that she had been drinking all day. I decided to get her an Uber home and paid for it. When the Uber arrived, she grabbed my arm and tried to get me in the Uber with her, but I told her I needed to get back to my house. She refused to get in the Uber, and even though I had already paid for it using the app, I had to be firm with her. What had just happened shocked me and turned me off completely. It was clear to me that this girl had issues, whether they were emotional or alcohol related, and I didn't want to get involved. The Uber driver was close to leaving because of the argument we were having. I was trying to convince her to leave me alone so I could walk home in peace and she could take the Uber back to her place. Eventually, after 15 minutes of arguing, she realized she had no choice. She couldn't come back to my place and she had to go back to hers. I was paying 20 bucks for the Uber, which was about a 15 minute ride to her house. She finally got in the Uber, started crying, and I shut the door. I told the Uber driver to drive, and I immediately started walking in the opposite direction. I realized what I had just avoided. On dating sites and apps, you have to be careful who you're meeting. The pictures on their profiles aren't always a true representation of who they are at the current time. It's sad, but also scary. Our generation's way of dating has been warped so badly that many people are damaged mentally because of the experiences they go through. I had always struggled with dating. I was the one who always chose the bad boy. The one who was good looking, had all the charm, and all the other girls, including my friends, liked. But after a couple of months, they usually showed their true colors and turned out to be nothing but trouble and unreliable. I would usually end up breaking up with them, or they would just leave. So over the last year, I'd had over five boyfriends. None of them lasted more than a couple of months, and some were even shorter. For the last four months I had stayed single because I was tired of these roller coaster romances. I just needed a break. I was 25 years old, living in the state of Vermont, in a town called Rutland. Now, I really wanted to find a boyfriend I could have a meaningful relationship with, and one that would last more than two months. In all the time I had been dating, I'd never tried using an online dating agency or an app, but I thought maybe this could be a good option. I researched several different types of online dating companies, and after checking reviews, I chose one. I filled in all the online forms and put down my preferences for what I was looking for. The hardest part was writing about myself for the profile, my hobbies, and interests, to help men see if I might be suitable or compatible with them. The last option, which was optional, was if I wanted to include a photo of myself with my profile. Some women and men did include photos, others did not, and relied on the description of height, hair color, age, etc. to help form a picture in their imagination and see if it matched when they met up for the first time. I decided not to post a picture, and it also meant I would not be prepared to meet up with a guy who didn't post a picture as well. But I was told I would have to, as those who didn't post pictures were all put into the same group, and those who did were in a separate group. If I liked a profile sent to me, I would be prepared to meet up and see them. The first 10 days were a nightmare. The profiles sent to me wanting to meet up were awful. Some of the descriptions and profiles just did not sit right with me. Most of them didn't have photos, and judging by the profiles, that was probably a good thing. In the end, I rejected over 14 guys just based on their profiles, without meeting any of them. On the third week, I found two possible dates. One was with a guy named Logan. He was a couple of years older than me and did include a photo, which was odd since I was told we couldn't be matched with people with photos if we didn't include one. He was pretty attractive, and his profile was good, so I arranged to meet him downtown at a wine bar at 8 p.m. the next evening. I got to the bar at a quarter to eight and grabbed a table. I had a small red handbag over my left shoulder since I couldn't find any red clothes to wear, so that would have to do. This was our way of identifying each other because he didn't know what I looked like, but I knew what he looked like. I said I'd wear something red or bring a red bag to help him find me. I ordered a drink and sat waiting. The bar was quite busy for a Thursday night. While I waited, a few guys tried to hit on me since I was alone and offered to buy me a drink, which I politely refused. I checked each one to see if they were wearing anything red, 
but none of them were. Time went on, and I finished my drink and looked at my watch. It was 8.30 p.m. I had waited long enough. I didn't care about the reason. I was annoyed and frustrated that the first date I booked ended like this, without the guy even showing up. I headed for the door, still scanning the room to see if I could spot anyone with a red item, but nothing caught my eye. I stepped out onto the street and headed for my car, which was parked down a side street just a bit from the wine bar. As I turned into the side street and walked to my car, I became aware of another car turning in. The car passed me, and then parked up close behind my car. I thought, what an idiot. They can't see I won't be able to get out if they park that close behind me. As I got to my car door, the car door behind me opened, and a scruffy looking guy got out. To my horror, he was wearing a red necktie. He said in a rough voice, You must be Susie. I'm Logan. We arranged to meet at 8 in the wine bar. Sorry I'm a bit late. I looked at him. He was nothing like his photo at all, but I could see the similarities. He looked 30 years older than the photo, like he had been homeless for the past six years. The man in front of me was not the man in the picture he posted. It was an aged version. This man was at least 50 years old, not 28. In the picture, he had short, dark hair. This man had long, greasy, blonde hair. He then said, How about it? Are we having the date or not? I said to him, I don't think so. I'm going to go home. I then noticed he was slowly stepping towards me. I looked around the street, but there was no one around. He said, I don't like being messed about, Susie. I then noticed he had a small knife in his right hand. He said, I want you to get in my car now. As he had been talking, I had slowly been putting my right hand into my bag. I then brought out my mace and blasted him in the face. He already seemed drunk, so he wasn't aware of anything. He dropped the knife and screamed. He brought his hands to his face, and with that, I kicked him straight between the legs, and he went down in a heap on the road. I screamed for help at the top of my voice while running. Around the corner came a security guard from the wine bar. I told him what had just happened and he got on the phone with the police. Once they checked, I was shaken but okay. I went to the police station to give a statement. That turned out to be my one and only ever internet date night, and I'm still single after writing this. We lived about 25 minutes from each other, so we agreed to meet at the beach pier about halfway between us. Before meeting, we had been texting, and he seemed totally normal. I was already at the pier when he texted me, saying he couldn't meet me there because his license was revoked and it was too far for him to walk. I should have just left then, but I agreed to meet him at a pizza place closer to him. As I walked down there, I eventually arrived and stood outside when I saw him. I quickly realized the pics from his profile were at least three to five years old. He looked like a much worse version of himself. His hair was greasy, it looked like he hadn't showered in days. His hair was a mess, and there were holes in his shirt. I awkwardly gave him a side hug and suggested we get a seat, but he said, Oh no, we're not getting pizza. Let's go to the park. Feeling uneasy, I agreed as he talked to me. I noticed his gums and teeth were stained black from smoking. By this point, I was completely turned off but tried to be kind and respectful. We got to the park and found a bench to talk. Before I could sit down, he pulled me into his lap, squeezing me and saying, Good baby girl, you are so cute. I awkwardly moved away and tried to start a conversation. He pulled out his phone and started texting, not really listening to me. After a few minutes, he interrupted me with, Have you smoked? He mentioned his friend was a dealer and suggested we go back to his place for a bowl. I declined. Oh my gosh, he said. Why not? Come on, just once, it will be cool. I declined again. Next, he pulled me close by the face and whispered, You're so innocent, before licking my face from chin to ear. Shell-shocked, I sat there for a moment, processing what had just happened. He kept talking about weed while I decided to fake an urgent call and leave immediately. My friends set me up with someone without telling me first. Naturally, I told them I wasn't interested in meeting anyone. After my last relationship ended, I was fed up with dating. They insisted, but I refused. 
and that seemed to be the end of it. Not long after, a strange man showed up at my workplace with flowers and gifts. He was tall and handsome. That day he was dressed nicely, wearing a sky-blue shirt and gray pants that fit him perfectly. He had a calm, mature demeanor, and I liked his confidence. He came to my desk and gave me the flowers and gifts, saying they were for my birthday. My birthday had already passed, but I thanked him anyway. He was really attractive. I noticed my friend giving me a knowing look from her cubicle. I quickly turned away so she wouldn't see me blushing. I wasn't expecting him to be that good looking. I was expecting some desperate creep trying to get into my pants again. But this man checked all the right boxes. I decided to give him a chance and go on a proper date with him. That night, I was less cautious than usual. I let his looks fool me and let my guard down. I didn't realize how much I judged people based on their looks. I did it so much that the usual alarm bells didn't go off to warn me that this guy's looks might be deceiving. Everything at first seemed normal and natural. He picked me up from his place, complimented me, and said nice things about my clothes. I noticed he didn't talk much as we drove. He answered questions, but the conversation wasn't flowing as well as I hoped. I didn't hold that against him. Some people like to concentrate on the road when they're driving. I get it. We got to the restaurant and sat down. His eyes were on me the whole time. Normally that wouldn't be a bad thing. Men have a way of looking at you when they're really into you, and I was familiar with that look. This wasn't it though. I felt like prey under his gaze. He wasn't even looking me in the eye. His eyes roamed all over my body, which was creepy. The conversation remained minimal even after we left his car. We ate and the food was okay, but the vibe was all wrong. Eventually I couldn't take it anymore, and I asked him what was up with his attitude. At first, he played dumb until I had to spell it out for him. He apologized and made excuses, saying he just liked hearing me talk. He asked me what I wanted him to talk about. My mind went blank. I didn't know enough about him to ask anything specific. I didn't want to ask about his job right away and seem like I only cared about money, but he was a complete mystery. So I decided to ask him what he did for a living. I could see his guard go up when I asked. He told me he was a businessman but refused to say more. The more I asked, the more he dodged my questions. It was getting really annoying. He suddenly got angry and asked why I was so fixated on his job. I told him I wasn't fixated on his job but wanted to know why he was keeping it a secret. Eventually, we both calmed down. He apologized for his outburst and suggested we go somewhere else. There's a bar nearby, he said. It's cozy and lively. It's easier to talk there. Without thinking much about it, I agreed, and soon we left the restaurant. He drove us to the bar, and from the outside, it looked a little rundown. I had my doubts as we went inside. It was just as bad as I expected. It was mostly men inside, which made me uncomfortable. We walked up to the bar and took our seats. I wanted to say hello to the bartender, but he was focused on my date. They seemed to stare at each other for a moment before the bartender turned away to serve someone else. When he came back, my date was ready to order our drinks. I didn't want anything too strong, so I got something light. My date ordered a bourbon. We talked more as we drank. He made more effort this time, and I was in a better mood. The alcohol probably helped. My tongue felt loose, and my worries faded. But halfway through my drink, I started to feel tipsy. I knew my limits, and I shouldn't have felt drunk already. I decided to slow down, taking a sip every now and then. My date noticed and asked if I was enjoying my drink. I told him I was enjoying it, but found it weird that he was paying so much attention to that. Soon, the feeling got worse. I was struggling to stay upright. I barely heard his concerned questions. He offered to take me home, and I remember agreeing. Moments between became a blur. I blanked out a few times. I blinked and found myself in the passenger seat of his car. We were driving somewhere, but none of the buildings looked familiar. I felt the car stop. My date got out, walked around to my side, and opened the door. I was lifeless and could barely move, but I was still conscious. He roughly hauled me out of the seat. My vision was blurry. I could hear his annoyed noises as he struggled to guide me into a building. I couldn't think straight since I had that drink at the bar, and now it was worse. I was conscious but barely there, and my body wouldn't obey me. 
I realized my date wasn't taking me home, at least not to my home. The panic hadn't set in yet. Whatever was clouding my mind kept me from freaking out properly. He carried me up some stairs of an old building. I can't remember if we saw anyone that night. My memory was too hazy. He unlocked a door and took me inside, dumping me on a bed. At this point, I was starting to regain some of my senses. I heard voices in another room, probably the living room. I couldn't understand what they were saying, just that they were yelling at some point. Then there was a loud crashing sound. My consciousness started to return more, just in time to be aware of a fight that had started. What are you doing? I heard someone yell in shock and fear. The sound of chaos continued. Furniture broke, glass shattered, and bodies were thrown against hard surfaces. There were more thrashing sounds and more fighting, more yelling. This time, there were different voices. With all the effort I could muster, I managed to roll off the bed and onto the floor. My legs still weren't working well, but whatever was in my drink seemed to be wearing off gradually. I crawled to the open door, just in time to see the man who brought me here getting wrestled to the ground by another man. There was another woman nearby. She wasn't standing idly by either. She ran around looking for something while the men fought on the ground. She went into the kitchen and came out again, carrying an electric kettle in her hand. Steam was coming out of it. It was boiling hot water. She rushed over to the two men and poured the boiling water on my date's face. He screamed in pain. The other man let go of him to get away from the hot water. He kept screaming, rolling around on the ground. The attackers didn't stop. The man grabbed a baseball bat and started hitting my date with it, aiming for his head. I stopped moving during the whole thing. I can't remember if I was standing or crawling. All I remember is my body shaking uncontrollably. I was closer to the door now, and it was wide open, like they had forced their way in. The man didn't stop hitting him with the baseball bat, even as blood started splattering everywhere. I couldn't see very well, but each time he raised the bat, it got a little redder. My date soon went still on the ground. No more sounds of pain. The only sound was the bat hitting his body. The man didn't look like he planned to stop anytime soon. I realized it was my best chance to escape. I kept close to the wall until I got to the door. I heard a sickening crunch as the bat came down once more. I didn't look. I couldn't make myself look again. I was already out the door, stumbling down the stairs. I had just seen the man who kidnapped me get beaten to death. I wasn't sure how that made me feel. I wasn't feeling anything. All my emotions were dead. I managed to stumble onto the streets. Even though it was late at night, there were still people around. They noticed me, and someone came to ask if I was okay. I could barely keep my balance. I told them I needed help, and the next thing I remembered was an ambulance arriving. By the next morning, most of the drugs were out of my system. The paramedics thought I'd gotten high on something. I didn't deny it. It was better than answering questions about the murder I witnessed. My friends got the same treatment. I later discovered they had found the man on Tinder and didn't know who he was. Needless to say, I don't speak with those friends anymore. A match with this super cute girl on Tinder. We decided to go out to a restaurant after talking for weeks on the app. It took me a while to get the courage to actually ask her out. Her name was Amelia. She was around 5'3", extremely attractive, short and curvy with glowing blonde hair that was natural. We decided to go to a restaurant in Dallas. I can't remember exactly which one, but it was a place that served burgers, fries, pizzas, and that kind of stuff. It wasn't a five-star restaurant, but I was happy just to meet this girl. I had been nervous most of my life, and this was probably my third ever date. As the date got closer, I started to panic. I bought this herbal tea that was supposed to calm you down. It wasn't the type that comes in bags you dip in water. It was a powder you measure out yourself. This was my first mistake, buying the measure out yourself herb. I can't remember exactly what it was called, maybe Kratom or Kratom. It was supposed to make you feel happy and calm, to help me be myself in this nervous situation. I found that I was super relaxed and confident around women when I was drunk, but that wasn't good. I shouldn't be drunk every time I'm around women, and that shouldn't be what brings out my best self. So, 
I started looking for other options. I ordered it from Amazon and decided to try it. I had never tried it before the date night. I waited until that Saturday night before taking any. Three hours before I was supposed to meet her, I got the jar out of the cupboard. I put the kettle on, steamed up some water, and decided to take around two tiny teaspoons of the powder. I mixed it in, it dissolved, and I sipped it. It tasted pretty bad, but I was taking it to calm my nerves and make me more confident, not for the taste. So, I finished the cup and waited for it to kick in. I was sitting on the sofa, dressed up in my gear, which wasn't a suit. If I remember correctly, I was wearing jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie at the time. We were only 19 years old. As I sat on the couch, I realized I wasn't feeling anything from the tea. I was just sitting there, waiting for my nerves to calm down. Instead, they seemed to get worse as the minutes went by. I messaged Amelia one last time to confirm she would be there at 7. She replied yes, and that was it. It was set in stone. The only problem was that my Kratom herbs weren't working. Nothing was calming me down, and I started to get heart palpitations and my breathing changed. I had a history of anxiety and knew this wasn't a good sign, but I decided to push through. I walked to the kitchen, got the jar back out, and took seven spoonfuls in a new tea. This time, I drank it all, hoping it would work. Another five to ten minutes passed, and it finally started to kick in. I felt more relaxed, almost like I was ready for bed, just lying there with a soft light on. I felt at peace and ready for the date, though a bit sleepy. I took an Uber to the restaurant and met her on time. We were both there, but I had to wait for her for about five minutes while sitting inside. I was seated first at a table in the corner, which gave a nice view of the road. It was something to talk about if we ran out of topics. As we started talking, we got our starters. I can't remember exactly what they were. Maybe tortillas, wraps, and some drinks. I noticed that my tiredness went away. But instead of nerves coming back, I felt a sharp pain in my stomach. I started to worry because I knew what it was. I had made a mistake by taking too much Kratom. My body was reacting badly, and I wasn't even a quarter of the way through the date. It was going really well, but now I had to deal with this pain. I tried to focus on the conversation, but the pain kept getting worse. Amelia seemed to notice something was off. I excused myself to go to the bathroom, hoping a splash of water on my face would help. In the bathroom I looked in the mirror and saw that I was pale and sweating. My heart was racing, and the pain was getting unbearable. I knew I had to get out of there before things got worse. I went back to the table and told Amelia I wasn't feeling well. She looked concerned and offered to help, but I insisted on calling another Uber to take me home. She understood and said she hoped I felt better soon. As I waited for the Uber, the pain intensified. I could barely stand up straight. By the time the car arrived, I was struggling to keep my eyes open. The ride home felt like an eternity. I kept thinking about the stupid mistake I had made and how I might not get another chance with Amelia. When I finally got home, I collapsed on the bed, still in pain. My mind was racing, and I was scared. I hoped the effects of the Kratom would wear off soon and that I hadn't done any serious damage to myself. I was being confident, asking questions, and we actually had a spark. I think she liked me, and being over six foot two probably helped. My nerves weren't even an issue on this date, until my stomach began to spasm. As we were eating the tortillas and our mains were coming, I got some really sharp pains in my stomach. I had no choice but to excuse myself to the restroom where I began throwing up everywhere. The green tea was coming out in my vomit, and I couldn't control it. With every breath in, I was vomiting back out the green tea along with some of the tortillas and starters I had just eaten. My mind was racing. Thankfully, I was alone in the restroom, and I tried to clean up as much of the mess as I could. But I realized I now had to face Amelia, the girl I was so attracted to and nervous about starting this date with. I had to make a decision. I could either bail completely, ignore her, and walk out of the restaurant trying to hold in my vomit, or I could go up to her and explain what happened. Just as I was about to do that, another wave of vomiting hit me. This time, I couldn't stop it. A guy came in while I was vomiting and asked if everything was okay. I asked him to get a staff member, 
and eventually, someone came in. I explained the whole story while trying to keep myself from vomiting. I told them not to worry, it had nothing to do with their food, which was actually good. I explained that I was on a date and had taken too much green tea, overdosing on a powerful herb that was supposed to make me relaxed and happy. The staff then went over to Amelia and explained what was happening to me. She was extremely worried but couldn't come into the restroom because it was the men's room. After about 20 minutes of non-stop vomiting, the ambulance arrived. They took my vitals and did some tests. They gave me a pill and an injection to stop the vomiting. They had to inject it into my butt, but it worked like magic. I stopped throwing up and eventually gained my composure. I tried to clean up as much of the mess as I could, but the manager told me not to worry. All that was important was that I was okay and that I got home safely. I was so embarrassed that night. I briefly spoke with Amelia as I was walking out with the medics and explained what had actually happened. There was nothing more liberating than being honest with her and not making up some silly story or running out of the restaurant like I had planned to do. This was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life and I learned to face my nerves and fears head on, authentically. I went on a date with this guy who I didn't really have anything in common with, but I thought I'd give him a chance anyway. We met up at a bar, and he had already downed two pitchers of beer but seemed completely sober, at least from what I could tell. We hung out and talked. Although he seemed nice enough, I wasn't quite feeling it. I wanted to leave, but he convinced me to go to another bar for one last drink. Seeing as it was only about 8 p.m., I reluctantly agreed. We went to another bar and sat at the counter. A couple next to us was making out. He looked at me and asked what I thought people would do if we started making out. I knew where this was going. I tried to laugh and make a joke about no one paying attention. He then insisted that we shouldn't make out. I nervously laughed and told him it wasn't a good idea, then excused myself to the restroom. When I came back, he had a shot waiting for me and insisted I drink it. No shot for him just for me. I declined, and he got really upset, saying he was ready to go. By this point, he had consumed two pitchers of beer, four margaritas, and two more pints, but didn't seem drunk at all. Still, I knew he had a lot of alcohol in his system, and asked if he thought it was a good idea for him to drive. He got extremely defensive, and said he was fine. We left the bar, and he took off in the opposite direction. When I got home, I texted him to make sure he was okay because he had drunk so much. His response was, I only date girls I go out with and have fun with. You're not for me. I realized then that I had dodged a massive bullet. I didn't know if he had spiked that shot, but the possibility crossed my mind. I got a really bad feeling from this guy. I'd been talking to this guy for about a month. I met him through a group of friends. We used to hang out in the parking lot with our cars. This was back when I was around 18 years old. At first we just exchanged Snapchats, and that was it. We only knew each other through mutual friends, nothing serious. He was cute, and I guess he thought the same about me. At first, our conversations were really awkward. We'd barely text, and when we did, it was just simple stuff like, Hey, how are you? Eventually, we started to talk more. Every Friday night, we'd meet in the parking lot with our cars. It was something I used to do when I was younger. The girls would have their cars, and the guys would have theirs. We met to admire the cars. The whole point was the cars. Some of us would meet there, and sometimes people would date or see each other. But that wasn't the main reason for the meet. Dating just happened if it was meant to. After talking to him for about a month, he started to open up more and become more confident. This was good for me and I finally thought we were onto something. I was waiting for him to make the first move, but it was awkward. He took so long, and whenever we were at the meet, he would just look at me but never start a conversation. I am pretty shy, so I rarely start conversations. I struggle to even keep them going when someone else starts. So, I thought of a way to get closer to him. By this point, I was really attracted to him. He was tall and had the type of face I liked. I knew he liked me but his shyness was a bit of a turnoff. Over the first month of talking, I wasn't expecting what happened in the second month. Eventually, his whole personality changed. Not at the car meets, though. 
He stayed the same there. He only changed over Snapchat. Over Snapchat, he talked so confidently. He sent me snaps of his face, voice notes, and even asked questions that felt very personal, even for someone you were dating. I didn't mind because I thought he was finally trying to get closer to me. We started talking almost every day on Snapchat. But the strange thing was, in person, he was so nervous. At the car meets, he did start coming over more, but he didn't say much. I wasn't sure if it was because of the other girls there, or if he was just shy in real life. Over Snapchat, he seemed super confident, which gave me mixed emotions and signals. By the second month, he was still messaging me daily, and then out of the blue, he suggested we meet up for food. He didn't say the word date, but I knew he meant it. I was excited because I had been waiting for him to make this move. No more awkward car meets. Now we could go out together, talk in real life, and enjoy some good food. I had been on dates before, but this felt different because of the mixed signals he had been giving me. I decided to give him a chance, hoping he would be more confident with just the two of us. He set the time and picked a Thai restaurant downtown. I showed up in my usual casual clothes, vans, jeans, and a crop top. He wore the same thing he usually did at the car meets, but something felt off right away. He was standing at the entrance of the Thai restaurant with three other guys. I didn't recognize any of them from the car meets, which was a red flag for me. I thought maybe he was so shy that he brought his friends for support, but things got worse. I shook his hand and gave him a quick hug. He was still really nervous and kept glancing back at his friends who were giggling. I asked if we should go in, and he said yes. Since he booked the table, he needed to check us in. We walked in, and his three friends followed us. I asked him if they were coming with us in an awkward tone. Uh, yeah, is that okay? He replied. What was I supposed to do, say no? His three friends sat at a table opposite us, and the whole date was awkward. He barely spoke a word, and his friends spent the whole time on their phones, glancing over and giggling every once in a while. It was so childish, and I hated every second of the date. The only thing I didn't hate was the food. It was pretty good. He paid for everything, even though I offered. That was the only confident thing he did all night, refusing to let me pay. After we finished eating, we stood up, and his three friends stood up at the same time. They followed us out of the restaurant. When we got outside and started putting on our coats, the guys behind us got uncomfortably close. I decided I would walk home alone. We hadn't planned anything for after, and he was being super awkward and quiet, more than he had ever been with me before. His friends were now so close they were almost touching me. The guy I was on the date with turned to me and asked, Should we go for a walk? It's a nice evening. That was a big red flag. His three friends were right behind me, and at one point, I felt one of them brush against my hip. They had stopped giggling and now seemed like the main part of the date. It felt like I was dating four guys, not just one. I needed to get out of this situation fast. Suddenly, I pretended to get a call. I stepped out of the circle they had formed around me, four guys standing outside the Thai restaurant on the sidewalk. I stepped to the edge of the road and pretended my mom had fallen ill and was taken to the hospital. I knew they probably could tell I was acting, but it was my excuse to leave. They offered to drive me to the hospital, which was a big no-no. I was shaking and felt so uncomfortable, certain that one of them had touched my hip as he walked behind me. The vibes were terrible, and I was convinced these three guys had manipulated the guy I was dating to try and take me somewhere. It was scary, but I managed to get out of it. I turned around, said bye, thanks for the food, and never looked back. To this day, I still wonder what would have happened if I had gone with those four guys. I still see the guy I dated at the car meet sometimes, but I don't even look at him, let alone talk to him. After a movie date with a guy I met on Tinder, we went back to my place. We'll call him Dude. I told him we could hang out for a bit, but I had work in the morning and needed to go to sleep soon. Dude said that was fine, but he was hungry and wanted to order some food. Okay, sure. Dude orders two large subs from a sandwich shop and a milkshake. He ate it all quickly. No judgment though. He's six foot four and must have been around 210 pounds. Younger, still growing, by all means. 
I didn't think anything of it at the time. We end up messing around a bit and then fall asleep in bed. I wake up to my front door opening and closing several times over about a five minute period. My dogs were going nuts. It's 1 a.m. What the heck is this guy doing? I open the door to my room which opens up to the rest of my apartment and see the bathroom light on with the door wide open. I step out quietly, trying to figure out what's going on. The sound of the door opening and closing continues, making me more anxious. My heart starts to race. I move slowly towards the bathroom, peeking inside. It's empty. I then notice something strange. My front door is slightly ajar. My mind races with thoughts. Did dude leave? Is he coming back? Why is the door open? I hear footsteps outside, but they're uneven and shuffling. I feel a chill run down my spine. I decide to close the door and lock it, hoping that whatever is happening will stop. I go back to my room, but I can't shake off the feeling of unease. I try to calm my dogs, who are still restless. I grab my phone and think about calling someone, but I don't know who to call at this hour. Then, I hear a soft knock on the door. My heart skips a beat. I slowly walk back to the front door, peeking through the peephole. It's dude, but something seems off. His face looks pale and he seems disoriented. I hesitantly open the door. Dude, what's going on? I ask, trying to keep my voice steady. He mumbles something incoherent and stumbles inside. His eyes look strange, almost empty. I help him to the couch, but my mind is racing with fear and confusion. What happened to him? Why is he acting like this? I sit down, trying to get more information from him, but he keeps mumbling and shaking his head. The unease grows stronger, and I can't shake off the feeling that something is very, very wrong. I walk around the corner and see dude squatting over my toilet. He has a stick and is poking around in the murky brown water which is about to overflow onto the bathroom floor. Horrified, he yells, Stop looking at me! Go back to bed! I have it all under control! I'm still waking up, trying to understand what I'm seeing and what's going on. I start to nervously laugh because I don't know what else to do. He yells, Why don't you have a proper plunger? I reply, I don't know. I never needed one until now. He tells me to go back to bed, insisting he has it all under control. I'm so disturbed and tired. I can't process what's happening, and I have work in the morning, so I go back to bed. I remember hearing him peek into my room a bit later and say, I fixed it, before leaving and closing the door behind him. The next morning, I hesitantly approach my toilet. The water is down, but there's something poking out from the bottom. Upon closer inspection, I see the tip of a stick, some gloves, towels, and a barbecue tong. I pull out about three feet of broken stick from my toilet, followed by several other fragments. Dude had broken several sticks trying to unblock my toilet. I realize I heard my door open and close so much because he was going outside to look for sticks in the yard. When one broke, he would go and get another one. Dude had left so many marks and stains all over my bathroom floor. He also left my apartment so fast that he left his underwear, undershirt, and socks on the floor. After work that day, I went straight to the store and bought a plunger. Lesson learned.